All right, welcome everybody. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Thrilled to be with you today uh, for the virtual reading group okay. discussing uh, the last chapter uh, of Origins of Totalitarianism called um, Ideology and Terror. Uh, a novel form of government. Um, so for many of you, I think, know this. Uh, this chapter uh, was not in the original book, was not in the first edition of The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, there was originally a, a, a short three or, three or so page uh, conclusion, uh, which was uh, in many ways quite uh, good. But... Um, uh, it was short and it brought the book to a close, but without uh, any, any kind of attempt to really um, articulate in Arendt's mind what is the what is the philosophical and um, core origin of totalitarianism. What is the how do we really understand totalitarianism sort of a, a final way. You know, you read this whole book, it's five, almost 500 pages. Um, what have we, what have we taken out of it? And, and after she finishes the book um, and, and publishes it, she writes a number of letters in which she says, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really get it. I didn't really finish it. I, I, ne I never really um, uh, got to the essence of, of what is totalitarianism. And and so um, starting in about 1952, the book originally came out in 1950, she begins to write a whole series of drafts and essays, some of which she never publishes, some of which she does publish, um, in which she tries to, um, in a sense, synthesize what she's worked on for the last, at that point, almost 10 years of her life in this long and, and brilliant book. Um, uh, she, she began writing this chapter, Ideology and Terror, uh, in 1952 in the summer when she's traveling in Europe. Um, and she originally meant it to be, uh, a central chapter of another book, uh, a book that she was going to call the modern challenge to tradition, to tradition. Uh, but she eventually abandoned that book and, um, instead, took a revised version of this essay, Ideology and Terror, a Novel Form of Government, first published it in German uh, in the as, the as the concluding chapter to the new German edition of The Origins of Totalitarianism, and then um, translated it and, tr and put it into English and published it as the concluding chapter of the second edition of the English edition. Um, There are, as I said, eight or nine different either drafts or published versions of different essays in this period that are all trying to do something similar, which is to talk about the nature of totalitarianism, the origin of totalitarianism. Um, I mean, not, not the origin, the essence of totalitarianism and get at what she thinks she didn't fully get at in, 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 the, in the book. At the same time, and I've mentioned this before, um, she goes back and rewrites large parts of the third section of the book on totalitarianism to highlight and emphasize some of these new insights that she's gotten. And so, um, you know, this is a very uh, fruitful period uh, in her in her research. Uh, it, it leads into uh, the book, The Human Condition, which comes after it um, and 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 is and is deeply important. Um, so this chapter, Ideology and Terror, you know, uh, is probably um, the most quoted and, and, and most um, uh, thought of uh, part of the book. It wasn't in the first edition. It really is in, in, in 20 or so pages, a little under 20 pages, I believe, um, one of the most dense and, and, and brilliant attempts to articulate 
a, a major thesis, namely, uh, what is the essence of totalitarianism? Uh, from the very title, right, the title, uh, which is Ideology and Terror, a novel form of government, you see three things that she wants to highlight. One is that there's something uh, that totalitarianism has to do with ideology. It has to do with terror. And it's a novel form of government. But in, in, in my attempt to present this very dense and complicated and yet brilliant chapter to you, I'm going to break it into five arguments. Uh, I'm going to say that there are five different arguments that Arendt um, is actually uh, making here in this chapter in her attempt to understand uh, what totalitarianism is. First, this chapter reaffirms Arendt's guiding insight, which she begins at the very outset of the book, that totalitarianism is new, that it is a novel form of government, thus that it's distinct from tyranny, it's distinct from despotism, it's distinct from fascism, right? This is something we've talked about consistently as we've been reading the book, but it's it's very important for her. And um, I think for those of us interested in thinking about this book as a spur to understanding our contemporary situation, it should be very important to us as well. Because um, a lot of what we see in the world um, is rising tyranny or rising despotism, or what we might call illiberalism or illiberal democracy. But that's not the same for her as totalitarianism, and we'll get into that. So that's the first thing, that it that totalitarianism is a novel form of government, something really new. And the newness of it is important. The second argument is that totalitarianism seeks a fundamental transformation in the idea of humanity, in what man is, in what humans are, away from being a free actor to someone who is continually fabricated and made to actualize themselves in accordance with natural or historical laws. So this is the second part. And this is the part that, um, you know, is not in the title, right? You have ideology, terror, novelty, but you don't have lawfulness. And yet, if you look at these, these, these chapters that we're, that I, that I mentioned that she's been writing from 1952 to 1955, this, idea of man as a, as 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 being made into someone who is in a sense to, must follow in a profound way in a, in a without freedom the laws of history and nature is a key aspect of what she's interested in and she actually writes an entire essay called law and power uh which we will read for next week uh it's one of the two essays i've asked uh it's already been sent around to you all and you should have it um it's never, it was not published in her lifetime, but it's been published in the last five years in the critical edition. And uh, it's really uh, an important essay. So um, that will be one we speak about next week. The third is that um, insofar as man is transformed away from being a free uh, actor into a product of higher laws, totalitarian subjects are molded to fit the laws of the movement by terror. And thus terror becomes the essence of totalitarian domination, which she already has said in, in chapter 12. Um, it's not simply a means for social control um, as tyrants use it. Tyrants have always used terror, but they use terror for some end, namely to control people, to suppress political dissent. Um, but in totalitarianism, terror serves a different function which is to fully eradicate human freedom in private as well as in public life. Um, the fourth uh, argument, um, and this goes, and this is also in the title, is that totalitarian domination fabricates its subjects in line with ideologies, in line with systems of thought that are logically rigid, even as they remove and insulate their inheritance, their adherence from reality. So, um, that's the fourth argument of the chapter. The fifth and the second one that's not mentioned in the title, but in my mind, maybe the most chilling and important, is that she argues that the newness of totalitarian movements, which are secured by terror, 
and motivated and inspired by ideology is made possible by the fundamental and new modern experience of loneliness, the ever more pervasive sense of being abandoned and set adrift in a world without meaning. So these are the five um, arguments that that I think one can find in this in this chapter. And I'll, I mean, you know, it's only 18, 20 page chapter, and yet I could we could spend four or five days discussing it. I'm going to try and 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 go through these five arguments a little bit in depth, each one, and then we can, of course, pursue them further. And then we're going to speak about this chapter again next week, but with um the, the with two other of her uh, drafts of it in our minds as well. So we'll have more time to consider it. So the first one again is that totalitarianism is a novel form of government. Um, she calls it. The, she says she speaks of what she calls the earth-shattering originality of totalizing methods of organization, right? And remember how important organization was to her idea of totalitarianism. That 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 propaganda becomes organization, but also total domination is about organizing people, turning them from a plurality into a unity. And that's what organization is. And she talks about what she also calls the extraordinary originality of totalizing domination and organization methods. In both Nazi Germany and Bolshevist Soviet Russia, totalitarianism, she writes, quote, developed new political, entirely new political institutions and destroyed all social, legal, and political traditions of the country. Thus, the drive of total domination is not simply to pacify and control a population. That's what tyrants do, right? It's not simply to make the trains run on time and 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 use terror or force to make order in society. That's what fascists do. But the goal of totalitarianism is to organize a people in accord with a single animating ideal. Thus, she writes, it is no mere th- she says that the origin, I'm sorry, the originality of totalitarianism is something new. And that means that it's tied in some profound way to our modern age. And if that's true, she says the dangers of totalitarianism will not disappear simply because Nazism and Bolshevism have been defeated. Right? Not, you know, just because. Nazism and Bolshevism are gone doesn't mean totalitarianism is necessarily gone. It's something in the air of modernity. It's not an accidental occurrence. Um, It will not disappear with the death of Stalin any more than it disappeared with the fall of Nazi Germany. And thus, in one of the more famous lines of this this, um, chapter, she writes, the true problems of our time cannot be understood let alone solved with the acknowledgement that totalitarianism became the century's curse only because it is so terrifyingly took care of its problems, right? The reason totalitarianism is a problem, I mean, it, is, it, it emerges. The reason it's there is because it is useful. It takes care of our problems. The problems of our century, the problems of meaninglessness, atomization, homelessness, rootlessness, loneliness um, all all of which all of these problems of 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 modern society for her are problems that um uh, totalitarianism has an answer to and thus she concludes that it may even be true that it may be true that the true predicaments of our time will assume their authentic form, though not necessarily the cruelest, only when totalitarianism has become a thing of the past, right? Um, yes, totalitarianism is cruel, right? And it's maybe the cruelest form of government known to man. As a form of organized loneliness, she says, totalitarianism is considerably more dangerous than tyranny and despotism. And yet, it may not be the worst, right? There may be other things that come after it that could be, um, that that could follow upon it, 
either in ways that are more cruel or less cruel, but that offer a similar solution to the problems that it tries um, to answer. And so she says, if totalitarianism is truly novel and a new form of government, how did it emerge, right? Um, uh, you know, it's rare that new forms of government enter the world. Um, you know, there's all, according to Plato, there was, you know, basically six, uh, you know, there's, there's monarchy and tyranny, there's aristocracy and oligarchy, and there's the polity and there's democracy. Um, and, and, and generally these six have been adequate for over 2000 years for us to understand different forms of government. Okay. Kant comes up with another definition. There's lawful governments and lawless governments. But how does a brand new form of government emerge? And Arendt says there has to be a new experience um, that entered the world to which totalitarianism is an adequate response. And she doesn't answer that here at the beginning of this chapter. It only comes back uh, in the last four pages of the chapter in which she names that new experience, the experience of loneliness. And what she's going to argue is that the experience of loneliness is that new experience, that new um, problem of our time uh, that makes the other forms of government in some meaningful way inadequate uh, to the human condition and which totalitarianism offered um, an adequate response. And we'll come back to loneliness at the end. But before she gets there and before she names loneliness as that modern experience, that radical modern experience, she says her second argument, which is that man in totalitarianism um, is the embodiment of laws of a movement. Um, uh, while it's tempting to see totalitarianism simply as lawless government or a new form of tyranny, she says on 461, she wants to say that totalitarianism is something radically new where what unites all other earlier forms of tyranny is their lawlessness, right? That the tyrant is above the law. They can, they can change the law. They can make the law arbitrary. Um, and in some ways, totalitarianism seems like a form of tyranny because it defies the positive laws. And yet she says, in its core nature, totalitarianism is not lawless. In fact, it claims to follow the law, but different laws, namely the laws of nature and history. She says that totalitarianism is monstrous, yet far from being lawless. If tyrants can violate norms and laws on a whim, totalitarian rulers gain their particular power by actually subordinating themselves to higher laws. They are the people, Hitler and Stalin are the people, who put themselves under higher laws in a way of bringing those laws to reality and actualization. So in other words, while totalitarian government may ignore positive laws, like a tyrant, the totalitarian ruler, far from being arbitrary, is actually obeying higher laws. Thus, they're more obedient to these suprahuman forces than any government ever was before. And this is that novelty. Thus, Arendt can argue that far from wielding its power in the interest of one man, like a tyrant, totalitarianism is quite prepared to sacrifice everybody, including the ruler, um, to the vital immediate interest and to the execution of the law of history or the law of nature. Thus, totalitarianism has this sense of aiming to establish a direct reign of justice on earth. And I know that's going to sound strange to you, but it's claiming to produce mankind as a product of justice, um, as the product of the laws of history or the laws of nature. It's saying that we are going to, in a sense, follow these laws so strictly that we remake mankind uh, to be just. Um. And in that sense, because it promises to make mankind the embodiment of justice on earth, um, it makes all laws 
laws of a movement. And the two examples that she offers here are Darwinism and Marxism, right? Darwinism says that man is the product of natural laws, natural laws of selection and development, laws of nature. Um, and these are racial laws. These are saying that the race of man will keep, um, uh, you know, uh, evolving uh, and it won't even stop with humans. It may end up stopping with transhumans, with AI, with humans becoming, you know, mere fodder for some great big machine in the in the future. Uh, and but these follow natural laws of hierarchy, right? And the Bolsheviks say that class struggle is the expression of the laws of history for the survival of the most progressive class. And thus Engels uh, says that Marxism is the Darwinism of history, which she cites on 463. So in both Darwinism and Bolshevism, which she understands as ideologies, the term law itself has changed its meaning from expressing the framework of stability within which human actions and motions can take place. And it becomes the expression of the motion itself. The law is the expression of the way that um, racial laws or not or or historical class-based laws actualize themselves in a claim of justice on the earth. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to realize these natural and historical laws and make man fully conform with them, well, what if men don't want to conform with them or what they don't conform with them? What if they have freedom and they want to act differently than the natural or the racial laws allow? Well, you need terror to fit man into that iron band of these laws of the motion or laws of movement. And this brings us to the third essence of totalitarianism, which is that as a material product of higher laws, right? these motion laws, totalitarian subjects are molded to fit the laws of the movement by terror. Terror thus is the essence of totalitarian dom domination. It's not simply a means for social control as tyrants use terror to suppress political dissent. No, it's much more than that. It is a tool, terror becomes a tool for totalitarian rulers to fully eradicate human freedom in private as well as in public life and to thus actualize the realm of ideological justice on earth. Thus, terror is the realization of the laws of a movement. Its chief aim is to make it possible for the force of nature in Darwinism or racism, or the forces of history in Marxism to race freely through mankind unhindered by spontaneous human action. That's on page 465. Also on 465, she writes, terror, therefore, is lawfulness, right? Get your heads around that. Terror is lawfulness. It is the realization of the law of the, mu of the movement of some superhuman force of nature or history that is now imposed on reality. It's taking the laws of nature and history and putting them onto reality, putting them onto man. That's what terror does in totalitarianism. Thus terror as the execution of the law of movement whose ultimate goal is not the welfare of men, right? As in, you know, in utilitarianism, nor is it even the interest of one man as a tyrant, but actually what terror as the execution of the laws of movement serves is the fabrication of mankind, the making of man into mankind, the elimination of individuals for the sake of the species, the sacrificing of the part for the sake of the whole. And thus on 450, 465 to 466, she writes, terror fits men into the iron band of terror. It substitutes for laws that are hedges protecting the space between men. So traditionally laws she could thinks of as hedges, as, as boundaries which keep my life separate from your life and gives me a certain amount of freedom. But terror is not like that. 
it substitutes for laws that are hedges protecting the space between men, what she calls a band of iron, which holds them so tightly together that it is as though their plurality has disappeared into one man of gigantic dimensions. Total terror thus uses the old instrument of tyranny, terror, but destroys at the same time also the lawless, fenceless wilderness of fear and suspicion which tyranny leaves behind. What does she mean? She means that in a tyranny, terror prevents you from speaking in public. It prevents political dissent, but it leaves you still what she calls a desert of private life where you could still be free. You can't build a public world. You can't act together, but you can have poetry. You can have little chess clubs. You can have RN reading groups. Um, it leaves that alone. Um, that desert of freedom. But she says in totalitarianism, um, this desert, which is not really a space of political freedom, but is of private freedom, it still provides some room for the for 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 some kind of freedom for its inhabitants in tyranny. But ter totalitarianism, by pressing men together, destroys even that desert. It destroys the spaces between them. Um, and it it's it, it, it with this iron band, as she calls it, even the desert of tyranny, insofar as still some kind of space appears like a guarantee of freedom. So terror destroys the one essential prerequisite of all freedom, which is the spaces between men. Um, if the essence of totalitarian government is movement, um, the aim and, and, and the and the realization of movement through terror. The aim of totalitarian education is not to instill convictions in men. It's not to make them believe something, she says on page 468. It's to bring them so close together to take away all of their privacy and freedom that they actually lose the capacity to form any convictions. And if that's the case, she says, what makes people act in a realm of totalitarianism? There's some sort of a craving need um, for some insight into the law of movement. The only way you can act is to act in accordance with the law of movement. And what guides behavior, she says on 468 in totalitarian rule, is that you are prepared on both sides to be an executioner and a victim. You're prepared, you know, in Nazism, you're prepared to be either an executioner of the race laws or a victim of them. In, 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 in Marxism, you're prepared to either be an executioner of the class struggle laws or a victim of them. And what prepares you to either be a victim or an executioner is ideology. And this brings us to the fourth uh, argument of this chapter. That totalitarian domination fabricates its subjects in line with ideologies, systems of thought that are logically rivid, rigid, logically rigid, even as they remove and insulate their, their adherents from reality. Ideologies, she says on 468, are isms that can explain everything by deducing it from a single premise. Race-ism, de-ism, right? Uh, communism. All of reality can be understood according to the idea of race, the idea of God, or the idea of class. Um, but this is a pseudoscience, right? The ideas of race or class are not that important. More, you know, you can actually put in any idea of race or any idea of class. What's important more than the idea is the logic of the idea. And this is the this is Arendt's real innovation in understanding of ideology, right? I don't think anyone really understood this before her, if you think it's right. The idea of ideology is not the idea. It's the instrument of explanation, that it follows its own logic. So racism is the belief that there is emotion inherent in the very idea of race. Deism is the belief that there is, an, that there is emotion inherent in the idea of God. Communism is the idea that there's a 
uh, motion inherent in the idea of class struggle. The, what, what the actual content of these ideas is not the core of ideological power. It's the logical deduction from premises, right? What she says is there are many ideologies, right? There's deism, uh, there's there's um, environmentalism, uh, there's uh, nationalism, right? But what makes racism and communism totalitarian ideologies is that the struggle between races and classes turned out to be politically important in such a way um, that Hitler and Stalin could take these two ideologies and take them with utmost seriousness and say, oh, well, if there are dead classes or dying classes, then these classes must be killed. If there are races unfit to live, then these races must be exterminated. The process is more important than the idea. And this she talks about on pages 471 to 472. There are three elements, she says, of what an I of, of 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 ideology, three totalitarian elements of an ideology on 470 to 471. The first is that an ideology explains not what is, but what is becomes. It has an element of motion to it. The second is that it's independent of all experience, right? It doesn't matter if the bourgeoisie are actually corrupt or not, or if um, the Aryans are a perfect race or not. It has nothing to do with experience or whether the Jews are actually um, uh, greedy or not, right? Nothing to do with it. It's, it's independent of experience. And third, that since ideologies have no power to transform reality, because they, because you can't actually make Jews greedy just because you say they are, right? You have to emancipate thought from experience by focusing simply on the logic, by focusing simply on the logic. And thus there's a consistency in ideology that exists nowhere in reality. And thus ideological, log ideological logic requires that we stop thinking, moving between thought and reality. And we exist purely in the realm of ideas. Um, in this way, in this fully divorced from reality, the ideal subject, she says, of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist. Because the idea is not what's important and the reality is not what's important. What you need are people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exists so that they can simply exist in their logical prison, their logical reality of an ideology. And this brings us to the fifth um, uh, argument in this text, um, which is that the novel emergence of totalitarian movements, right, novelty, um, secured by terror, the essence of totalitarianism, inspired by ideology, which um, is the principle of, 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 of uh, t totalitarianism, is made possible by the fundamental and new modern experience of loneliness, the ever more pervasive sense of being abandoned and set adrift in a world without meaning. We come back to this basic experience, which she says is new in the living together of men. Um, isolation is not the same thing as loneliness. Tyrants isolate people so that they can prevent them from politically challenging them. Isolation is the beginning of terror and it's a proto-totalitarianism. But since isolation leaves the private sphere intact, it's not totalitarianism. Loneliness is something completely different. Loneliness is being deserted of all union, human companionship. Totalitarianism, insofar as it's a response to loneliness, destroys, destroys all private life as well. It bases itself on loneliness, on the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is among the most radical and desperate experiences of man, she says on 475. On 477, she writes, loneliness is so unbearable because of its loss, because it is the loss of oneself that can be confirmed only by the friendship or the company of equals. To be a self, you need other people who trust you so that you can trust yourself. 
Without friends, she continues, and others, and plurality, we can't trust ourselves. And we are thrust back into the only thing that we have left, which is our human mind and logical reasoning. That's the only thing that becomes reliable. If we're truly lonely and no one else is reliable or we can trust, all we can base our, our, our self on is logic. And so she quotes Martin Luther, who says that it's not good for man to be alone. A lonely man, Luther says, always deduces one thing from the other and thinks everything to the worst. And she writes that the famous extremism of totalitarian movements consists in this thinking everything to the worst. So long as loneliness remains a human experience, totalitarianism will persist as a possible form of government. And on 478, she writes, there remains the fact that the crisis of our time and its central experience have brought forth an entirely new form of government, which is a potentiality and an ever-present danger is only too likely to stay with us from now on, just as other forms of government, which came about at different historical moments and rested on different fundamental experiences, have stayed with mankind regardless of temporary defeats, monarchies and republics, tyrannies, dictatorships, and despotism. Those forms of government still are around because they also represented possibilities of experiences of mankind. But now that there's a new experience of mankind, loneliness, the form of government that responds to that is now with us, likely in perpetuity. All right. That fact that totalitarianism, which responds to loneliness, is unfortunately with us in, pertu in perpetuity, uh, means that um, we have to understand the origin of totalitarianism in this fundamental experience of loneliness and understand that if we're going to resist and face up to the possibility of totalitarianism, we have to understand where it comes from and why it's attractive. And it's attractive because in responding to totalitarianism, it gives man, it puts man into meaning, into movements that provide for them um, a, a sense of self and identity, which are increasingly uh unable to be found elsewhere. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, obviously, this is a quite rich chapter. Look forward to the discussion. You can engage in the chat. Please do be respectful. Uh, and you can also raise your hands. And I see there's already a bunch of hands. Um, and we will uh, engage in discussing this text. I look forward to it. Hannah. Um, I'm just wondering, doesn't this sort of point to the collapse of religion as the uh, force that prevented totalitarianism from coming into being? Or at least doesn't it suggest that it, that's part of it? That's my question. So, um, I mean, she doesn't mention that right here in this chapter, but yes, uh, um, the, you know, what she talks about in a lot of her texts written in the 1950s is the, um, the, the crumbling of the pillars of tradition, uh, right. and, 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 and the, um, the, 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 the crisis of tradition, um, uh, uh, and, and, and that's what she is, you know, that is the background for this. What makes people lonely? Where does loneliness come from, right? So she says loneliness is, is an old idea. You know, it's not a new idea. Um, people have been lonely throughout history. But for most of human history, she says, loneliness is what she calls a borderline phenomena. You know, people who are very old or sick or, um, you know, maybe a little bit eccentric, uh, um, are often alone and they, you know, exist outside of it. But most people have a framework for their lives and a sense of purpose or meaning. Um, man can endure almost any tragedy or pain 
if they find meaning, right? I mean, think about a people um, whose um, cities and houses are being bombed and destroyed and who have almost nothing to live for economically or socially and yet believe deeply in, a, in an idea like a religion or a religious claim that or 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 a claim of 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 self determination that will give them a sense of purpose and as bad as it is and awful as it is they find they can they can they they can ex, they can accept the pain and the tragedy and and still carry on um so the whole idea of secularization and all that stuff plays into it Yes, it plays just, into it. Just one and, more and, question. And the argument is that without a kind of, as religion, as tradition, as um, as sort of the 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 sort of structures of 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 um, the structures that have given life meaning retreat and become more private, as opposed to public, uh, which is part of what secularization secularization means. Um, uh, people don't, people are more at risk of, if they can't on their own, find a meaning or purpose in their lives, not having one and thus not having a sense of self and needing, um, some political movement to provide it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the, that's the argument she makes. So yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, James. Great analysis, Roger. Um, I read this chapter maybe four or five times. It's so dense and delicious. But I, at the end, I come to chewing on the contemplation of an end in history. Right now, the loneliness is our loneliness is being accelerated ag algorithmically. We've lost connection with each other, and we've subsequently lost connection with our common sense, which she had talked about in this chapter. In this acceleration, our identities are emerging apart from each other rather than in commons. Now, at the, at the end, she says, but there remains also the truth that in every end in history necessarily contains a new beginning beginning the supreme capacity of man, freedom, that a beginning be made, man was created. This beginning is guaranteed by each new birth. It is indeed every man. But new birth now is AI, algorithmic trading, social media, quantum computing, plundering private equity, world one, world two? Are we... Should we be contemplating the end in history? Oh, dare I. <laughs> All right, James. Um, I, I think, you know, you're, you're asking uh, probably the right question. Um, you know, Arendt, uh, you know, does say at the end of the book, right, that, um, that we need to, um, that, that is as, as awful as things get and as, um, lonely as as people are and as totalitarianism uh, has emerged, um, it's not our fate, right? She wants to hold on to that. Man is free and man is free to start something new. And, you know, remember, both Stalinism and Hitlerism uh, failed uh, in the end. Uh, um, and, and, and she takes that very seriously. In, in the book that comes after this, that she writes after this, The Human Condition, um, she says that the core of politics is transcendence. Now, what she means by that is not religious, but that what politics requires us to do is to come together um, and, and transcend uh, our, our sort of personal uh, differences and create a, a common culture, a common world, a common polity, 
uh, that we share. But the um, world that we're creating now, world one, world two, with the AI, the algorithmic trading, social media, quantum computing, plundering private equity, what are we creating? Well, we're not creating that's anything. That's a great question. What are we creating? What, I mean, the point I mean, is, we don't have to create that. In the end, it's up to us. Um, and that's where she leaves it. And and it may be you think, oh, well, we we don't have any choice. It's happening. But but she thinks we do have a choice. Now, it may get much worse. But her hope and her faith is that um, totalitarianism can never be complete. So long as there are human beings, because human beings um, always have um, the potential for starting something new or freedom. I'll, I'll give you an example that um, What's is inspiring in, you. I'll give you an example that's in my head. Okay. Um, there's a, a movie that's playing right now called the zone of interest um, by uh, a, a director named Jonathan Glazer. I spoke about it last night at a movie theater up in, in the Hudson Valley, Millerton movie house. Uh, it's an extraordinary movie. It's I think the best Holocaust movie that's ever been made. Um, uh, and, um, it, it, it concerns Rudolf Haas and his wife, Hedwig Haas and their family, uh, who are the, he's the commandant of Auschwitz and in an extraordinary, um, uh, move for a, a Holocaust movie, as far as I can tell, you never see a prisoner during the entire movie. Uh, you never see, uh, someone in, in the camp. You hear them, and the the sound in the movie is haunting, but you never see them. Um, but uh, near the end of the movie, there's this one Polish girl who is the one hopeful character in the whole movie, who finds a canister, um, and in the canister is some crumbled up sheet music, which it turns out uh, is sheet music by. Uh, one of the uh, um, uh, people in the camp, Joseph Wolf, uh, which is written in Yiddish and is called Sunbeams. And it ends with, you know, all the different depravities which we are suffering. Nevertheless, we hold hold on to the flag of freedom. And it's one of the most extraordinary in, 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 in Yiddish, right? Um, beautiful uh, um, expressions of in the camps amidst the horrors amidst the complete eradication of freedom and the camp, you know, this is Auschwitz three we're talking about, like one of the worst of the worst. Um, uh, the, 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 the inmates get together and sing a song about the possibilities of freedom. Um, if, you know, that to me, is an expression of what Arendt means by uh, the way that totalitarianism, which is an attempt to fully eradicate freedom, runs into the problem that as long as human beings exist, um, there will be a threat to totalitarianism. Now, obviously, if we replace human beings with bots and AIs, that may not be the case. Uh, and, you know, you may find that AI allows for an even greater threat to human freedom than Auschwitz III did. Um, and that would be horrific if it does. But our job as, as humans is to continue to think about how to use AI and how to um, limit it, you know. And, and, and you know, when, when AI, when, when ChatGPT first came out, uh, you know, and, and Ken Rouse, uh, I think in the, I forget whether he writes for the journal or the times, you know, started talking to it and it tried to convince him to leave his wife and marry it. Um, you know, he, Microsoft went and changed chat so that it put certain boundaries on what it could do and what it would say. Um, you know, how much are we going to limit it? How are we going to regulate it? How are we going to resist it? How are we going to train ourselves and educate ourselves so that we can, um, resist the allure of some of these um, uh, artificial intelligence 
uh, desires. So, you know, that's the challenge of freedom. If, if you think the main threat to freedom is artificial intelligence, which it may well be, um, the, 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 the response has to be, how do we um, preserve realms of humanity, uh, spaces of humanity um, for freedom to continue to exist? And, 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 I, and I think it's, it's a challenge. There's no doubt about it, but I don't think it's an impossible challenge. I think that the greatest danger is the loneliness. That it just it's increasing exponent exponentially. No, well, I mean, I think I think loneliness. You know, uh, so the you know for for those of you who are members of the center, the conference next year is tribalism and cosmopolitanism, right? Which is and last year's conference was on friendship. You know, these are all attempts to grapple with this problem of what does it mean to not be alone. Um, can we create cosmopolitan? Uh, worlds that are not lonely, um, you know, uh, or and or do we have to move into a more tribalist feeling where people feel a, a tribal connection with others? And with that comes things like um, discrimination or, uh, you know, um, a kind of uh, ethnocentrism or things of that sort. Um, you know, there's a deep human need for connection and being part of a group. Can you create cosmopolitan groups that provide that sense of connection um, for uh, the majority of the people in the world? Only um, at the Arendt Center. Yeah, well, I mean, the you know, nothing against the Arendt Center, but we're we appeal to a select group, not to masses of people. Uh, and I don't think that will ever change. Um I, I think we I think it's possible to create uh, communities of meeting on a cosmopolitan level, but I think they're rare and I don't think they're um, mass movements. Um, and uh, and and I think there is a problem in politics today about uh, to what extent um, uh, what to what extent we can uh, um, carry forward cosmopolitan liberal, governance uh at a time in which um it's obviously not answering the needs of our population i mean if you look at the main public health crisis in the united states and i think in most of the liberal world it is mental health right yeah. that mental health illness that mental health crisis that we're in is largely a crisis of meaning and loneliness it's a crisis and what's amazing is that if a country is having a mental health crisis and it goes to war, suddenly the mental health crisis goes away because in the midst of a war, you have purpose, you have meaning, you, you come together and you fight together. And then when the war ends, mental health returns. This is, this has been a well-studied and well-documented, um, uh, um, uh, 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 phenomena. That's a, an incredible indictment of liberal uh, Western society. The fact that people in it are so unhappy that they um, uh, would rather at times be in a war and are happier at war than they are in peace. Uh, that's an extraordinary indictment of liberal Western society. And um, one that those of us who are trying to defend liberal Western society need to honestly confront what should i read about that is there a book on that uh well anything hannah arendt wrote but um the keynote speaker at our conference next year is sebastian junger uh who writes oh, yeah. about it quite brilliantly um yes. his book tribes and yep. freedom uh two two of his more recent books tribe and freedom are, are both on that topic and uh i think would be well worth taking a look at. Thanks, Roger. Yep. Susan. So I just want to go on record to challenge this idea of isms uh, being the same as ideology, because I think what's happened, at least in our time, is that this use of ism is being tacked on to all kinds of things. And my main example of this is feminism, which I disagree is not 
this kind of ideology that is prescribing what's supposed to happen in the future. It's an analysis of the past, but it is in no way like Marxism and Maoism and all these other isms. So I, I really find um, this problematic to, to say every ism becomes an ideology that is rigid and is giving the answer for everything. I just don't see it. Some of these are, but I think so many things are now being called ideologies and, and really as a way of silencing people and saying, well, you're adhering to an ideology and therefore you're not willing to hear anything anybody has to say and so forth. So certainly as a feminist, that is not how I see it. It's not how I feel. I don't think it fits in this definition that she uses. Right. No, I, thank you. Um, so you know, what she says is that not um, that not all ideologies are totalitarian ideologies, right? Um, uh, and um, and so, you know, it in fact, most are not, right? Um, so she doesn't have the same critique of feminism or environmentalism or uh, nationalism that she would have of, um, communism and, and, and racism. And, and by the way, there are, um, forms of, uh, communism and racism that don't need to be totalitarian either. Um, uh, they, you know, they happened to in the 20th century, um, have become, uh, two ideologies that uh, were weaponized in ways that became totalitarian, but they don't have to be. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't think environmentalism has to be a totalitarian ideology, but it can be, right? It, uh, if, 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 you're a, if you're an environmentalist who says um, uh, the earth you know, is, is the mother and the earth comes first. Um, and, and we must protect the earth against all things that may, you know, the logic of that means that all things that injure the earth must be eliminated. And then the things that injure the earth more than anything else are human beings. And so there is a radical environmentalism, right? Earth first ideology, which has inspired some, radical environmentalists um that becomes totalitarian in its in its in its approach um it's not mainstream environmentalism um and it hasn't ever um succeeded in becoming a political ideology that inspires the masses uh, i think there can be a totalitarian feminism but again it has never as far as i know become um a dominant part of feminism and become a dominant part of um, our political world. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think her analysis um, requires in any way that any of these other isms um, be, be seen as totalitarian um, or political weapons in that sense. Uh, most of them are not. And um, she's just saying that these two became that and um and and when they did it had very little to do with the content of their ideology and much more to do with the 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 logical coherence of it so um i guess the only uh, other thing i i would say i i don't think the word radical should be used uh interchangeably with extreme and to me radical means going to the root and I would call what you're describing extremism, um, yeah. but not that's, a that's obviously a fair point. That's I mean that's obviously Arendt's point in in Ike in in her understanding of evil. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, here in this book, she uses them interchangeably. Later, she she will um, uh, change that. So it's a fair point. Um, extremism is the is the point uh, that that she's interested in. So yes, thank you, um, Ken. Oh no, John. I'm sorry. John. 
what I find interesting is uh, throughout is that the salvation for man seems to be that he thinks or that we think and we're constantly reborn. And I also get um, the feeling that this is how this this fear of extremism is how and loneliness is how she comes to the point of view that the best form of government is one that provides us with the greatest plurality. And um, what I keep asking myself is, how do we get society to move to that particular point um, where it can become a dominant thought? And I wonder uh, if you have any thoughts or comments on how uh, our aunt might uh, prescribe a movement rather than or, or uh, the opportunity to arrive for society to arrive at that point. Um, she speaks in terms of uh, the hopefulness at the end is when she makes the comment on, I think it's on 478, that totalitarian domination uh, carries the seeds of its own destruction. That's a wonderful statement, but um, uh, it sounds more like hope than reality based upon her writings. Well, I mean, I don't know why it would be more hope than reality. The two great totalitarian systems of the 20th century both collapsed. Um, uh, and, you know, so from her point of view, um, you know, they carry the seeds of their own destruction. Now, obviously, um, you know, they were contested by by other countries and other peoples. Um, but, you know, they didn't, they weren't successful in, 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 in sort of, um, uh, turning everybody into, uh, mere, um, totalitarian subjects, right? There's, uh, there were people who dissented, uh, even in Germany and even in Russia. Um, and even if they were killed or lost or put in camps, their acts of dissent continued to inspire others. And so from her point of view, um, freedom doesn't die. Uh, it continues. Um, you know, uh, if you're asking, you know, um, how do you build a free society? Um, uh, you know, she, she spends a lot of time thinking about that, but it, it's not going to have, um, it's not going to ever have, uh, uh, an answer in the sense of, you know, liberal or illiberal or, or things like that, but it, it's going to, her answer is going to have to, going to come down to something along the lines of, um, uh, creating, um, frameworks of power and authority, right? Power in which there are uh, uh, institutional spaces for people to come together and act to build meaningful worlds together. And authority uh, in that there are certain institutions that um, people respect and thus preserve and keep um, the institutional arrangements of that society um, going uh, in time because people uh, respect the authority of those institutions. Right. Um, so it, 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 these are the, you know, these are the ways that she imagines uh, we have to uh, come and structure society. You have to have the power to create meaningful movements and you have to have the authority to uh, respect uh, limits and 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 coherence of of larger uh, institutions in which you're part of, um, it, and, and that's the way she imagines that. Yeah, it just seems to me that um, that history has been a, a, a the has been a, a theater of 
we go through these phases and that each of these moments carries their own seed of destruction, whether it be we have a moment when we do have a liberal uh, structure and 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 uh, a moderate form of government, and it splinters, and uh, and and uh, man just seems to be that it it those moments in time do not remain, and that this cycle of uh, we enter these phases and then we move to the next, and they each have their own seed of destruction and it's it's this constant flow that man is is seems to be trapped in okay but what's wrong with that i mean it's not a matter of right or wrong roger in my mind i'm just it's just an observation that that's each called... one of these phases even if we got to the to the most desired form of government which would be in in a rent or as i understand a rent to be one of um a, a fractured one where there was many strands and many opportunities for every side to be heard, it eventually carries its own seed of destruction. And then we move to one where um, you, you um, that man seems trapped in this ever, ever ending cycle of one moment in time breathes uh, uh, is a path to the next, uh, to the next, uh, movement and that uh, uh, and 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 we see it you know I, I I think this is what we see and this is what we're trapped in and it's, it's a very um, uh, I, I I wonder uh, is that what life is that really uh, what life is about and in any form uh, and uh, uh, I, mean, yeah, I don't understand why I'm I don't understand six years so I I keep seeing, I, I, I see these repeats. So that's yeah. all. It's just. I'm not sure why that's a problem. I mean, that's what freedom is. Uh, you know, um, you know, that's what, that's, that's what freedom is for our end. Um, there's not one, uh, there's not one stable lasting government that will last forever and ever. Um, things go, uh, Things, things rise and they fall. Um, the struggle is to uh, always keep uh, open the possibility of freedom, uh, you know, in the next, uh, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a possibility. No, and, I don't see it as a problem. I, I, okay. I, I'm not looking on it right. as a problem. I'm just look, just see, uh, observing it as a man's condition. That's it. Yeah, I think that's right. Stephen. Hey, Roger. Um, I, my question is touching upon what Susan raised with regard to ideologies and isms um, on the quote on page 468 that is coming out of the single premise. Uh, so my question, and I'm going to inform my questions by two short quotes. So my question is, on what ground could you possibly hold an, a non-ideological thought? And I'm going to quote uh, Slavoj Zizek here, the, the tragedy of our predicament when we are within ideology is that when we think that we escape it into our dreams, at that point, we are within ideology. And then the other, so, you know, can, can we really escape ideology? And the other quote is actually a quote of yours in your recent Amor Mundi piece on uh, non-ideological thinking. You claim thinking is the very opposite of ideological reasoning because it maintains always an openness to considering, understanding, and learning from others, even from our enemies. Now, uh, in that claim, one can hear dualism, uh, in that the opposite of thinking is ideological reasoning. We can hear liberalism in the word openness. We can hear intellectualism in understanding and learning. And we can hear pacifism in engaging with our enemies. So my question again would be, on what ground could you possibly hold a non-ideological thought? Well, I think my sentence answers your question. 
Your, your um, question is built on a number of ideo ideologies. Well, you know, the fact that you can hear five or whatever different ideologies within one sentence, A, doesn't prove that it's ideological. And in fact, maybe proves that it's not. Um, but, you know, the, the, the premise of it is that um, to think, which is to see the world from the perspective of others to um, open yourself to experience and to reality as opposed to being caught up in the logic of an idea um, is, is very much um, the opposite of what ideology is. Now, it's a belief. Uh, is it a belief? Is it, it's a practice? Um, what is thinking if it's not ideological? Um, you know, uh, why does it have to be ideological? I mean, you said it's a dualism. Um, it's, it's, it's to say that, I mean, if ideology is something that separates us from reality and is based on the logic of an idea, and yet you now say we're going to confront reality and we're going to not deal with logic of idea, but open ourselves up to a different kind of judgment um, and reconcile with the world as opposed to um, force it to conform to uh, logic. Um, you could say it's it's it represents an opinion. I think it does. Uh, it certainly represents a worldview or an opinion, but it's a non-ideological worldview or an opinion. Well, I guess I'm pointing to the I guess I'm pointing to the philosophical philosophical conundrum that even maintaining that there is such a thing as non uh, ideological thought is itself an ideology. I, I mean, I, I yeah, I know, I, Stephen. I know what you're saying. I think you're wrong. Okay. I mean, I mean it's it's not it, it's an opinion, right? Um, and it has certain presuppositions. I'm not saying it doesn't, uh, but it's not an ideological opinion because it's one that. Um, is not caught up in uh, um, anti-reality, and it's not caught up in the logic. It's 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 actually premised on, on on resisting the core ideas of what an ideology is. Now, that doesn't mean it's it's without presuppositions. It doesn't mean it's not a prejudice. It is. It's I can say it's a prejudice, hmm. but it's not an ideology. Yeah. Okay. I guess, I guess we'll get hung up on, you know, and I think that's why she tried to parse it in three sections. What is this ideology? And I think it does, you know, kind of inform what Susan's bringing up with our isms ideology. I mean, um, and then all the maneuvering to try and decouple those. But so let, yeah, let me, I'll put it this way. There's a difference between a prejudice and an ideology, right? I can have a prejudice in favor of environmental, the environment, and not make it an ideology. Now, to the extent that prejudice becomes hardened and I stop thinking in real terms, it turns more and more into an ideology. But if I constantly open myself to... Um, you know, counter views and 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 constantly undermine any certainties I have, it it becomes a very weak ideology and becomes more and more a prejudice. Um, thinking is an attempt to uh, uh, um, hold opinions that are as free from logical and unreal uh, ideas as possible. Um. I, I don't think that's an ideology. Um, now, if we were to say, um, you know, we all have to uh, um, think at the expense of, you know, eating, um, and we were going to become, uh, what's it called? Like, uh, who are the, um, who are the Zombies? ascetics, right? And we were going to like, you know, hold ourselves and thinking was going to be so important that we weren't going to do anything else, then we would make thinking into an ideology. And, you know, we would we would lose connection with reality. 
Um, uh, um, but but I don't think thinking it has to be an ideology um, in that sense. I think it can be an opinion. Um, uh, you know, am I wrong? Um, well, I'm just know, wondering it, if we the, tend to, as soon as we raise the word ideology, there's this immediate impulse to demonize it, to say, oh, that's an ideology. And I think that's some of the point that Susan's making. That's an ideology, and I'm going to use that against you. And I think there's this kind of um, uh, connotation with that word. And, I, and I'm struggling against that because I think you can't. I'm, I'm a little with Zizak. I don't think you can get away from having a ground of ideology. I mean, whatever you say is going to put you into some kind of camp and you're going to have to work your way through it. Yeah. Um, See, but you're, you're, you're mixing up two ideas as is Zizek to all respect to Slavo, right? I mean, there's a difference between having a camp and having an ideology, right? Yeah. You can be pro environment or pro women and not be ideological about it. Um, ideological is something different, right? It's, it's actually emptying away from it's 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 retreating from the idea of um women in feminism or you know or or the environment and environmentalism and prioritizing the logic over the reality and that's ideology that's not and so if you resist that um you're you know then you're philo environmentalism or your philo womenism or philo judaism is not ideological could, could we replace the word logic with the dogma of it because i think that no why because the whole point of logic is that it's it's not an opinion like a dogma is it's a it's a it's a it's a pseudoscientific um uh um you know uh logic logical uh in the sense of you know from the premises it 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 it, it turns us away from uh the world and it tries to it's in a step-by-step -step logical process um i mean you know those of you who have taken a logic course know what i'm talking about uh but it's 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 freed from all um uh real things I'm just going to, I have to move on for time. -wise. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Yep. Thank yep. you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I know, I know I should know your first name. Warren, Warren, Dr. Warren. Yes. Yeah. yes. Warren. Okay. Thank you. You can hear me, right? Yep. Great. Thanks so much for a wonderful lecture. Such an important chapter, you know, uh, to the point of loneliness, I think it's, it's so crucial to think about and, um, especially in, in my work, I'm a psychologist and a senior fellow uh, for a think tank called uh, Equimundo, which is the Center for uh, Justice and Social and Masculinity Studies. Um, there's the attraction between for men who I think are lonely as a group for reasons of development and uh, traditional ideologies. Uh, and their attachment and their attraction to fascist movements, which is really rampant around the world. We have published a study of 50,000 men, American men, a study of American men on our website now. And the, there's a huge, huge amount of loneliness and meaninglessness and confusion and attraction to right-wing uh, figures and fascist movements. And I'm wondering... Um, Apropos of that, did Arendt discuss anywhere, or did she think about gender masculinity in relationship to these issues? And if she did, would did she have any solutions or suggestions? Yeah, thanks. It's an important question. I mean, Niobe Way, who spoke at our last conference on friendship, um, I know this, is, this is what her work is about, and uh, and you know. Um, and you know she's interested in the ways in which our culture um, forces men to um, to not connect uh, and and to and to 
diminished connection and be more individualist and strong and, and, and whatever in ways that lead to them to being uh, lonely and, and disconnected. Um, and, and, and that's, and a lot of her work is on that and it's, and it's, and it's very important work. And I'm sure it's related to what you're doing. And there've been a number of recent studies, including your report, which I think I've read with her uh, about how um, the increasing uh, loneliness of men has been leading to uh, a, a, a turn towards illiberal um um, sometimes right, sometimes left wing illiberalism, uh, both in different countries. Um, uh, you know, I think that's an important, uh, um, thing to think about. Uh, it comes back to what I was talking about with James, uh, about, um, you know, that we have to take seriously that there's something, um, deeply dissatisfying for large portions of our country and our culture in the West about um, liberalism. Uh, and it's one of the things that we have to confront. Um, you know, as for Arendt saying a whole lot about gender in that way, not so much. Uh, you know, I, I did in, 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 in her letter to Gershom Sholem in 1963, when he accuses her of, not having love for the Jewish people and, and require and asks that she, you know, um, uh, take certain things back. Um, she says that the only reason, um, that he was really upset with her book is because, um, uh, he expects her to agree with her because he's a man. Um, and that men, uh, expect to be listened to in ways that, um, make it hard for them to actually listen to other people, including women. Um, and, uh, and that friendship requires um, really listening to and respecting the opinions of others. And she wonders if he as a man is capable of friendship in that way. Hmm. Uh, that's how she ends that letter to him in 1963. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not something she writes a lot about in her in her work but uh i think that's there and it's clearly something she noticed in some of her male interlocutors throughout the years this quick response you know that's great um the other factor about men and war uh which uh, you noticed know about meaning and camaraderie it's also uh men are bored you know we live in a kind of boring culture often for men and war promises uh among many things you noted, uh, excitement. So that's something else we have to think about. Yeah. I mean, the that. question is what, why does it have to be boring and, and what's boring about it? And why is, you know, what is it about our culture that's boring? And, right. and you know, there's different answers to that. Sebastian Junger really has an answer, which is that we need a kind of tribal identity, um, which we find in things like crises and war, which we don't find in, um, uh, wealthy, peaceful societies. Um, uh, what to do with that, and you know whether one can overcome that and find meaning and tribe tribalism in in peaceful societies is, I think, an important question. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that, but I don't want to take up. Yeah, there are a lot of ways we could address boredom, but that's yeah. a whole other topic. All Thank right, you. Irene. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Berkovitz, for these uh, magnificent talks we have. Uh, it's really um, a great privilege to be here. Today we have talked a lot about freedom and the importance of freedom to humans. I personally believe that is the most important gift that we have as humans. But I want to put into the table the idea of Eric Fromm on the fear of freedom that states that Nazism was due in part 
because humans develop a fear of their own freedom. For centuries, humans had a given religion, a given profession, and they didn't have any option to make a free choice. When society evolved and humans were given the capacity to choose, they found themselves in a way that they didn't know how to react. So they embraced totalitarianism because these movements told humans what to think and act. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Irene. I mean, I think there's something to Fromm's view that, you know, we are terrified of our freedom. Um, uh, um, you know, it's, it's something I tell my students all the time. They come to me and say, you know, well, I say, what do you want to do with your life? And they're like, well, I want to do this, but I can't. I say, why not? Well, I have to make money, my parents, this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, don't be afraid of your freedom, right? You know, you're free to do other things. You may have reasons for following what your parents say. There may be good reasons. There may be good reasons to make a living. I'm not saying don't, but don't think, you know, but remember you're freer than you think you are. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's many ways in which so many of us are um, on a regular basis. Uh, um, um you know, we limit our freedom uh, for 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 a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, you know, you know, you're you're the 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 force of your question, right? Is is there something um more than that? Is there is there a way in which freedom um uh, uh leads to uh totalitarianism? I don't think so um necessarily uh I think that there are I think freedom can 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 lead us to build communities of meaning and I think freedom can lead us to um uh to to engage and and even also to respect authority I mean for Arendt, authority in its traditional sense is something that I freely take on because it makes sense to me um, I think freedom becomes a problem in the modern age uh, when um, uh, it becomes uh, um, divorced from authority and becomes um, simply whatever I want to do uh, and a kind of liber libertarianism or libertinism, if you will, um, at which point... Um, it's very hard to uh, to have it um, uh, provide uh, any kind of coherent social meaning that will allow us to sacrifice or suffer in the name of it. I, I think one of the things that you know we see is that sacrifice and suffering are actually part of what um, it means to be human, uh, and that we have to have something that we're willing to sacrifice and suffer for. Um, and when we don't, um, that's when um, that's when we become abandoned or lonely in the sense that Arendt's talking about. Well, uh, it, it, is that all right? Yeah, I, I was going to ask you a second question, if it's possible. Well, we're, um, I'm, the problem is we're already at two thirty. Um, I was going to give Tim the opportunity to at least say his question. Tim, do you want to just, do you have a quick question or is it something long? Uh, I can't hear you, but uh, okay. I still Come can't hear you. Hi, Roger. Um, hi, everybody. I've really enjoyed these, um, these reading groups. Um, my question was about isms. Um, I was, I was thinking about Susan's question, Susan's observation that uh, 
it's dismissive to think of feminism as a uh, ideology. But I do think that um, that there are th six big groups that people try to find meaning in that are almost impossible to find meaning in. One is nation, ethnicity, religion, uh, political ideology, race, or or gender. I think that a lot of people try to find their identities in these and wind up warring uh, because of what I think an ism evokes more than anything else, which is the enemy. Is, isms have a, have a tendency to set up a binary where there is an enemy to overcome. And even with feminism, there's a, there's a tendency for some feminists to treat men as the enemy. And this is a, a this is a mistake that I think that is endemic just about of any isms or those major six that I mentioned. So I wanted to point out that that um, that we find meaning a lot of the times in smaller groups, but these large families like race or like uh, religion or ethnicity, which may just be based on the language that they speak, all of these large family groups are usually leaders will try to lead these groups and evoke the isms and the binaries and the enemies of the of the large group. So a lot of our ident identity struggles seem to come out of that. Um, that yearning of individuals to find meaning in groups that are much too large for them to really find meaning in, except in terms of an enemy versus enemy struggle. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I mean, this. I mean, I'm, the the answer I'm going to give is related to the answer I gave to Susan and also to um, Stephen, right? Which is that, uh, you know, not all um, uh, thinking of affiliation or dogma or opinion or prejudice is ideological. Mm -hmm. um, uh and you know the some of it is and so the challenge of being thoughtful in Arendt's understanding is to constantly try and um be aware of and critical of the ideological elements in your thinking uh and um to try and to the greatest extent possible keep it out now I mean, I think Stephen is saying, well, you can't. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that you probably can't keep all of it out, um, but you can do a lot. And, and that's what she's calling us to do. And as long as you do that, she's saying your, your ideologies or your isms or your opinions or your dogmas may be problematic, they may be prejudiced, they may be one-sided, but they're not going to be totalitarian. And that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, we're going to continue this discussion next week. We're going to read two other versions of this kind of, of this last chapter, uh, which she published, which she never published, but which we were later published in the book um, that came out um, a couple of years ago, this big poem called The Modern Challenge to Tradition, Fragments of a Book, a book that was never written. Um, and uh, we've sent around to all of you uh, PDFs of two of the other drafts. If you haven't gotten them, send us an email and let us know at rent at bar.edu uh, and we'll send it out to you. And uh, we'll read that for next week and it'll be our conclusion of, of, this, of this book and our reading of, of her work on totalitarianism. We'll follow that starting March 1st on Friday, March 1st with Eichmann in Jerusalem. So if you haven't gotten that book yet, um, now's the time to get it. Look forward to uh, talking to you next week. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and see you soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Gracias, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Thank everyone. you very much. And spasiba. Spasiba. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Just great. Até logo. Até logo. Thank you.